Well, good morning. It's good to welcome you here this morning to worship at First Baptist, and we know that you aren't here by accident, so we're just looking forward to what God has in store for us. You know, he tells us to always be prepared to meet him, and that's what we want to do this morning. So let's prepare our hearts to meet Jesus right here where we are and hear what he has to tell us as we face the world this week. Let's prepare for worship. this morning as we get ready to worship together in the way of announcements as we get started i want to let you know just about a couple things first of all tonight at six o'clock we're going to have a fifth sunday night singing in the sanctuary for all those of you who could be here gary ray's uh discipleship class he's been teaching is going to be off for tonight it will resume next sunday night so that you can come and be a part of our singing tonight and i'm also excited to let you know that our new classrooms, our Sunday school classrooms that we have renovated and built uh, in the back of this building are going to be open as of next Sunday. We're actually going to have an open house next Sunday morning. We'll have food and coffee and donuts and muffins set out about 845. And we want to encourage you to come and take a look. And those classes are going to be meeting in there starting next Sunday. And so we're so excited about that. We want to invite you to be a part of that. We're going to have just a time of prayer now as we get this service going. If you would, bow with me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the beauty of today. Thank you for this past week, Father. As we look back and we see the things that went on in our life, it's sometimes easy for us to forget about how you've walked us through everything. I pray that we won't do that. I pray that our focus will be that we see how you work in every aspect of our life as your children. And Lord, I just want to thank you for that. I want to just say thank you for watching out for us, for your grace and your mercy that carries us on a daily basis and the love that we have through you, Father, that we can share with other people as we share the message of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for that. And we ask you now as we worship you together, Father, just speak to us through your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are not only to be prepared to meet him right here in worship, but the Bible says that we need to always be looking for the second coming of Christ because he is coming back to redeem his own. Amen. And that's where we're going to focus our worship this morning. Will you stand with me as we begin with when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Oh, yeah. 
so much for the opportunity that you have given each one of us to decide to spend eternity in your presence. And you did that, Father, as you paid a great price through the giving of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be reconciled to you. Now, Father, we just pray that we might live a life dedicated to being worthy of that sacrifice. Not a perfect life because, Father, you know that we can't do that. But, Father, a life where every day we give up a portion of our life to the control of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, Father, may we spend each day looking for that time when he is going to come back and claim his bride to spend all eternity with him. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Peace. Mm-hmm.
and there is no one like you, Lord. Amen. He is coming. And that just so happens to be the subject of the message this morning, the coming day of the Lord, as we complete uh, this series of 16 messages from First and Second Peter. You know, the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be the greatest event in all of history. The return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will also be the concluding event in all of human history. No wonder it's such a prominent theme in Scripture. In the New Testament alone, there are more than 300 references to our Lord's return. 23 of the 27 books in the New Testament refer to this great event. And for every prophecy on the first coming of Christ, there are eight on his second coming. If you've ever read a book or viewed a movie for the second time, you know that if you're aware of how the story ends, you're not exactly overly concerned with the development of the plot. The promise of Christ's return is a source of of confidence for the believer because there are so many dangers and difficulties in the world today. And people are literally biting their nails and wondering if they're going to survive. And this pandemic, which we have endured for the last two years, has simply increased that concern. I said to somebody the other day that if there's anything that we've learned from this pandemic, it's the uncertainty of life, the brevity of life. But a knowledge of God's program for the future eliminates a lot of that anxiety and it creates for us a sense of assurance. In the face of the chaos of today's world, we need that encouragement. So this morning, as we complete this series of messages in First and Second Peter, it's appropriate that we focus on the promise of His return. 
Jesus himself, prior to his death and resurrection, promised that he would one day return to the earth. You see the words of Jesus there from Matthew 26, 64. Would you read it with me? Hereafter you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. The Apostle Paul often referred to the return of Christ in his letters. You see the verse there from Titus 2.13. We wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But these believers who were the recipients of Peter's letter had a problem. We talked about that problem last week. There were false teachers among them who were questioning the return of Christ. And they asked, 2 Peter 3, 4, where is the promise of his coming? I mean, if your Lord is going to come, where is he? We don't see him anywhere. So this morning, we examined Peter's response to this question, where is the promise of his coming? Three major points that Peter gives us here. Number one, his return is certain. The return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is absolutely certain. Notice what Peter says, 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 3. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word and the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So... Who are these mockers that, Jesus, that Peter is talking about here? Well, they're the false teachers that we examined in detail last Sunday. One of the things they're doing to disturb the church is that they're mocking this idea that their Lord is going to somehow return to the earth one day. The mocker or scoffer, as it is sometimes translated, is not a new thing in the history of God's people. The psalmist pronounced a blessing on the person who does not sit in the seat of mockers. And three times Proverbs presents the mocker as someone whose ways are to be avoided. Mocking is a typical response to the truth of God's revelation. Mockers don't reason against the truth of God's word. Instead, they just choose to belittle it. They make fun of it. We see a hint of that here in the text. Where's the promise of his coming? We don't see him. Oh, is that him? No, no, that's just a cloud. Ha, ha. See, they're, they're just having fun, mocking the word of God. In asking where his coming was, they were implying that it was somehow past due, and therefore it was not going to happen. They're saying the church fathers are asleep, that is, they've died, and still... No sign of this Jesus that you talk about. They were skeptical of divine intervention in the world. We don't have that today, do we? <laughs> there are mockers all around us, mocking, belittling the truth of God's word, doubting it, making fun of it. Uh, they, they deny the whole idea of God's providence they're saying that God has a hands-off approach. He, he refuses to get involved in the affairs of the world. There are a lot of people like that today. But Peter counters that argument with three examples of how God has dramatically intervened in the course of human history. First, he says the very creation of the world itself represents God's intervention. He created the world through water and the Word. Second... By water and the word, he destroyed the world in the flood in Noah's day. And third, God will do the same again, only this time he will use fire instead of water. So in response to these false teachers who 
see the world as going on in the same way forever, Peter makes it clear that God has destined the world for a sudden end. The present heavens and earth are being reserved by fire, he says. Reserved for fire. The universe that now exists is under a sentence of condemnation, in other words. It's being kept for the day when God will judge the world and sentence the ungodly to destruction. It's interesting that only here do we find this reference to the destruction of the world by fire. Nowhere else in the New Testament are we told that the earth will somehow be destroyed by fire. Obviously, God cannot use water again to destroy the earth because he promised to Noah that he would never again destroy the earth by a flood. However, when we turn to the Old Testament, particularly to those passages passages that have to do with the day of the Lord, we do see this imagery of fire. In fact, the term the day of the Lord in the Old Testament refers to the day of judgment and destruction for the ungodly. So keep in mind that in the New Testament, the day of the Lord becomes the day of Christ's return when Christ himself will come and judge all the earth. But a couple of verses that you'll see overhead here. One is from Isaiah 66, verse 15. The Lord is coming with what? With fire. And he will bring down his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Fire. So Isaiah used this imagery for uh, the last day. And then Zephaniah 118, in the fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end for all who live in the earth. Now, most scholars view these graphic references to the fire of God's judgment by the Old Testament prophets as metaphorical as symbolic. The fire is symbolic of God's raging anger against the ungodly who mock his name and make light of his promises. However, I believe the fire here in 2 Peter is literal. It's not hard to imagine the world being destroyed by fire. In fact, it seems quite natural almost to, uh, I think, to my mind. We could point Today, to man's ability to, sh- to destroy the world through atomic weapons. That would certainly be a fiery end, wouldn't it? That's been possible for the last 75 or so years now. But I don't think God's going to rely upon humankind to do the job. I think he's going to handle the matter himself. Scientists tell us that the world is in constant danger of being struck by an asteroid. In fact, the world is bombarded daily by these small meteorites that burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Every week, one the size of a basketball burns up. A few times a year, we get one the size of an automobile. Scientists tell us that the dinosaurs were wiped out by such an event when an asteroid about six miles in diameter struck the Earth 65 million times years ago down in the Yucatan area. It's not hard to imagine then that one day a really big one will come and the whole earth will be destroyed by fire. I don't know obviously if that's going to happen or if God will just say the word like he did in the beginning when he first created the universe. However God chooses to do it, it's going to be okay by me. But there's one thing that we need to remember here. And, and this is really the main point that Peter is making. The day of the Lord will come. It will come. Christ will come again. It is a certainty. One day the skies will unfold and Christ will appear in all of his majesty and glory. Human history as we know it will come to an end. Christ will judge all humankind, the earth as we know it will be destroyed, and a new heaven and a new earth will be created, and then the eternal age will be ushered in, and it will be a glorious day. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. That is the promise of God's word, and it is as certain as God himself. Amen?
Number one, his return is absolutely certain. Number two, Peter says his timing is merciful. His timing is merciful. Let's pick it up in verse 8 of 2 Peter chapter 3. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the day, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Peter was writing to a group of believers who who needed some reassurance. They were genuinely excited about their faith in Christ, but they were also experiencing persecution and adversity. They were going through tough times. They were feeling pain and frustration and discouragement. Therefore, they were eagerly anticipating the Lord's return in order to escape the hardships of the world in which they lived. Peter had already reminded them in his first letter that the end of all things is near. Jesus himself had warned his followers to be prepared for his coming. So it's easy to see how such an emphasis could lead to disappointment when Christ didn't return as soon as some of the believers had hoped. I mean, they were not looking for Jesus to come one day out there. They were looking for him to come any day, any moment. They were anticipating it. And so when some of their group began to die, they began to wonder, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's up with this? Why is the Lord delaying his return? So Peter makes a couple of points in response to this concern about the apparent delay of his coming. You see the bullet points there on your outline. First, he said, realize that God's perception of time is different than ours. God's perception of time is different from ours. He said, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. God, being eternal, does not experience time as we do. What seems like a long, long ages to us is a mere blip to him. God views the passing of time from a different perspective than we do as humans. We tend to get impatient and upset. Uh, every so often, by, by even short delays. But God is patient. He's willing to let centuries and even millennia go by as he works out his purposes in the world. Peter is warning them not to get impatient because God is at work in the world and Christ will come in due time. He also tells them to understand God's purpose in delaying the return. Understand God's purpose in delaying his return. The false teacher saw the delay in Christ's coming as a sign of God's lack of involvement in the affairs of humans. They thought, well, God's not really concerned with what's happening here in the world. Christ is not coming. There's no judgment. Therefore, people might as well just do as they please. Eat, drink, and be merry. But rather than being a sign of God's lack of concern, his delay in sending Christ is actually a sign of his deep love and compassion for us. In God's infinite patience, he's waiting for people to repent before it's too late. Why? Because he doesn't want any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That is, for all to come into a trusting relationship with Christ. Aren't you glad that God, the God that we serve, the God that we know is a patient God? We serve a God who is patient and slow to anger. He patiently waits for us to repent and turn from our sins. You ever made the same mistake twice? You ever committed the same sin again and again and again? Aren't you glad that he is a patient God, that he is the God of the second chance. However, his patience doesn't last forever. There comes a time when we have to respond to his patience with faith and repentance. And so the big question here is, who is meant by this word, any, 
He doesn't want any to perish. Some believe that Peter's referring specifically to those who fall and pray to these false teachers that he's talking about here, that God is patient with them and wants them to repent before it's too late. Rather than bringing judgment on them, immediately God withholds his wrath, waiting for them to repent and get right with him before it's too late. I certainly see this as a possibility, but I believe God's patience is not limited to those who are influenced by false teachers. I believe when the Bible says that God doesn't want any to perish, he's referring to the whole world. He doesn't want any to perish perish every person without exception paul said god wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth you may ask then if god desires it why doesn't everybody come to a knowledge of the truth that's because they have to choose it god is not going to make that choice for you or for any human being you have to choose to believe the truth of god's grace Through faith in Christ, many choose not to believe that truth. And that's why we have so many mockers today who are making light of the Word of God. They've chosen not to believe in a personal God. But God's timing is merciful. He's waiting patiently for any and all who will trust Him to come to a knowledge of the truth who is Christ the only way to God and to salvation. But one day, Christ will return, and the waiting will be over. Number one, Peter says, his return is certain. Number two, his timing is merciful. And number three, his purpose is renewal. Renewal. He wants to renew all things. He wants to renew us Those who've trusted him, he wants to renew the heavens and the earth around us. Look at 2 Peter 3, starting in the second half of verse 10. The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat but according to his promise we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells Peter informs us here of three things that will happen on that day. And these all come from verse 10. So look at verse 10 there. He says, the heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavens refer to all that God has created in his universe. The roar refers to a loud rushing sound such as the crackling roar made by a huge bonfire. He says the the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The elements probably refer to the basic building blocks of the earth, though it could also mean the heavenly bodies. And then he says the earth and its works will be burned up. The world that emerges from this fiery judgment will be one that has been purified by God's fire. The return of Christ brings both destruction and renewal. Therefore, we should live holy and godly lives, not only because this world is going to be destroyed, but also because a new world is going to take its place. We need to begin now preparing for this new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. So Peter asks a question, what sort of people ought we to be in light of this truth of a new heaven and a new earth coming. In light of this new uh, truth of this this kingdom of God that is going to come and everything's going to be made new and and we're going to live in a a place of righteousness forevermore, what what kind of people ought we to be? It's a good question. It's it's really a question that we, we ought to ask ourselves on a regular basis. And he gives us the answer here. He says, first, we need to be holy and godly. 
We need to be holy and godly. To be holy is to be set apart from the sinful world around us. It means to be different. The word holy means other than. It means to take on the character of God himself. We are to be holy. We are to be a peculiar people, different than the the society and the culture around us. Be holy. And then to be godly means to do the things which are pleasing to God. It means to choose to conduct yourself in a way that is God honoring. Be holy and godly in light of the fact that Christ will return soon. And then he says to be forward looking. Be forward looking. We are to be looking for the coming day of the Lord, he says. Then again in verse 13, he says, We are to be looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We are to have an attitude of eager anticipation, a spirit of expectancy. You know, that makes all the difference, doesn't it? I mean, when, when, when life is not going your way and you're down in the dumps, just remember this. We need to have a spirit of expectancy each day. When we expect God to do something, what is that? That's called faith, isn't it? Faith, expecting God to do good things and looking forward to that day when our Lord returns and we have a new life and a new heaven and a new earth. Looking ahead to what our great God has in store for us. We need that motivation. We need that forward-looking attitude. We, We need to recognize that God has a plan and that it culminates in eternal blessing for His people. That's what faith is all about. Faith is trusting God for the things we hope for. We we have a glorious hope as believers. Living in hope means living in the eager anticipation and expectation of the good things that God has in store for us. As the people of God, we have something to look forward to. We need to be forward-looking. We need to be holy and godly. And then he mentions this third thing that kind of blows us away a little bit. It's, it's such a, a shock. It's a surprise. He tells us to hasten the day. Hasten the day. What does he mean by that? I mean, we're not only to look forward, we are to hasten the coming day of God. The, the NIV says we are to speed its coming. What in the world does that mean? Surely, this is not saying that we can somehow hasten the end of history, does it? I mean, this seems to be so outlandish. While it may seem that way at first sight, but this, in fact, is is deeply rooted in Jewish and Christian teaching. The rabbis claimed that the Messiah would come if all Israel would repent and obey the law perfectly for a day. Peter himself reflects this tradition in his sermon at the temple way back in Acts 3.19 when he says, "Return, repent and return to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. We may think that the idea of believers hastening The coming of Christ takes away from the sovereignty of God. After all, doesn't the Bible make clear that only God himself determines the time for the end of all things? But what we we have here is an example of this interplay between human actions and God's sovereignty. God is fully sovereign. He is almighty. But human actions are still significant and meaningful. For example, prayer. Prayer is, a, is an example of this. Last Sunday, we talked about how God chose to save Lot from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah only after Abraham prayed on his behalf. Now, would he have done so anyway? Who knows? The point is that God considers the prayers and the actions of his People. So Peter is suggesting that God graciously factors his people's 
us, believers, followers of Jesus, he factors his people's actions into his determination for the time of the coming of Christ. Exactly what actions are we talking about here? Well, we've already seen that Peter tells us holy living is one of those behaviors that gets God's attention. Jesus seems to suggest that missions and evangelism is a way to hasten his coming. After all, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel will be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. Finally, we can add prayer to the list because Jesus taught us to pray, may your kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus. So if you're weary of this world and you really want Christ to come soon, then live a holy life and share the good news of Christ with as many people as you can and pray often. Lord, may your kingdom come. Live in an attitude of expectancy, expecting the Lord to come and make all things right. When Christ does come, Peter says, there will be new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The NIV says the home of righteousness. I like that. The home of righteousness. You know, I don't have to tell you that we live in a world where wrong often prevails. We live in a world where faithful believers suffer for doing the will of God. We live in a world where evil people enjoy the rewards of their sinful behavior. We live in a world where innocent lives are ripped from their mother's wombs. And we live in a world where God's promises are often mocked and made light off. But when the new heavens and earth arrive, all of that will be changed forevermore in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. I read a story the other day that, that spoke to me. It's about a missionary who had just finished teaching a Bible lesson to his students in a West African Bible college. And one student raised his hand and he said, The Bible says that when Christ returns, he will descend from heaven with a loud command. I would like to know what that command will be. Well, the missionary said, I wanted to leave the question unanswered and to tell him that we must not go past what the scripture has revealed. But my mind wandered to an encounter I had earlier in the day when a man had narrowly escaped the torture of a death squad from a local civil war that was raging. I saw flashbacks of the beggars that I passed along the street each morning. Every day I see how poverty destroys dignity and robs people of the best of what it means to be human. And I'm haunted by the vacant eyes of those who have lost all hope. Finally, from deep within the heart, his response bubbled up. Enough. Enough is what he will say when he returns. Enough suffering. Enough starvation, enough terror and murder and enough death and enough indignity and enough hopelessness and enough sickness, enough disease, enough. It's over. And he has come to change all things. This is how John puts it in Revelation 21.3. Now the dwelling of God is with humankind and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain for all these former things have passed away what a day it will be. 
And what should be our response to these things? Let us be holy and godly. Let us be forward-looking and let us hasten the day of his glorious return. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we are not hopeless people. We live in the hope that our risen Lord and Savior will come again for us one day. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week or next year. But Lord, help us to eagerly anticipate that day, to be forward-looking, to wake up every morning thinking this could be the day, to know that every injustice we suffer, every incident of pain or disappointment is only temporary. For a new kingdom is coming when all things will be made right. So Lord, encourage us. Help us to live holy and godly lives. Help us to share the good news of our Lord and Savior with those around us. Help us, Lord, to hasten the day when he will come. We pray, Lord, for that one who needs to come today and trust Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life. We pray for that family that you're calling to come and join this family of faith so that we may worship and serve you together. And Father, we pray for that one who's carrying a heavy burden today. For that one who may be living in a spirit of hopelessness, and needlessly so. Lord, we pray for that person to come and bring their burdens to you today. Have your way in our lives, Lord. We pray that you would change our lives today. In Christ's holy name we ask it. And God's people said, amen. Let's stand as we sing together. You come as God speaks. come now to worship our Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings as our men come forward to receive our offering this morning. The Mark Enfinger is going to come and lead us in our prayer. And we will remember Dustin and Jill Connor who are serving the Lord up in Ontario, Canada and all of our other missionaries serving the Lord uh, around the world. And uh, so let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Okay. Father, we just thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our blessings, Father, so that the, uh, the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ can be spread throughout this world. And, Father, that the, uh, the time that Christ comes back can be hastened. Now, will you just bless this time, Father, and may it uh, accomplish your purposes. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. morning about the second coming of Jesus, but I think it's going to be a really wonderful day when that happens. If we look in Revelation, um, in 
chapter 5, verse 11, says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. And just before that, in chapter 4, it says there are creatures that worship day and night, day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. And I hope that we're all there that day, worshiping alongside them.
Thank you, Jody, for that uh, very appropriate song. What a, what a way to close out the service today. Let me remind you, this is the fifth Sunday. That means tonight we will dedicate our evening uh, time to just worship and praise. We'll be, meet here in the sanctuary. After the snacks up at five, we're meeting here at six, right? And uh, you're going to hear lots of solos and different people that you may not normally hear on a Sunday morning. So it's, it's really a, a time of wonderful uplifting of the Lord and praise that you don't want to miss. So we hope to see you here this evening for that. And uh, let's stand together for our closing prayer. And Brother Tommy McNorton will come and lead us as we pray. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you today and just offer up the song that Jody just sang. Lord, you know all our hearts. You know where we stand with you. I just pray that as we leave this place, that we would let your light shine through us. Keep us safe. Go with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.